Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this first of uh, three uh, in a series of three talks on Tocqueville and the American Republic. Um, my name is Ty Tessitore, and I am a member of the newly renamed Department of Politics and International Affairs. I'm also the senior co-director of the Tocqueville program here at Furman. And my main task is to introduce our speaker. But before doing that, I'd like to take a moment to say something about the Tocqueville program, which is sponsoring this event. So the reason for the Tocqueville program is to encourage serious and open engagement with moral and philosophic questions that are always embedded in political life. And we invite in this program students to dig deep by examining the enduring problems that often underlie our most immediate and pressing concerns. To this end, the program sponsors a number of <laughs> courses and several activities, um, all of which emanate from the history of political thought. Every year, we offer a lecture series and accompanying course focusing on questions of contemporary concern. This year, our general theme is Tocqueville and the American Republic. And if you look at the titles of the three lectures that will be given, the contemporary concerns which emerge are needs of the human soul, politics and the needs of the human soul, why the state grows ever stronger, and a very timely need for moderation as a virtue uh, in contemporary, a needed virtue in contemporary politics. That's something of the three lectures in the series. Uh, but in addition to the lecture series and what we call the Tocqueville course, um, we explore, uh, the Tocqueville program offers a range of courses in, political, in the history of political thought that uh, invite students to explore surprisingly enduring themes across the ages of, of continuing influence and concern. Um, the, the second uh, part of the Tocqueville program, second major part besides the courses and lecture series, is um, the Society of Tocqueville Fellows. This is uh, a select group of students who ha are chosen by a competitive application um, and who are interested in focusing their studies on political philosophy. They don't they could be, there are any number of majors, but they're, they, they're particularly interested in this area. And we provide several other opportunities for them to explore that interest. The final uh, element of uh, four, really, is um, we work closely with the Political Thought Club. This is an independent student group that meets every Friday afternoon um, to talk about great works of literature and philosophy. It's an hour. Anybody's welcome to come. You don't have to commit to come every, every week. Um, so if you want to learn more about the Tocqueville program, there are some materials on the table outside. You can take a look at that. If you want to get involved, um, you can talk to anybody who's already in it, myself included, or look at the literature there. Uh, I would be amiss if I did not acknowledge the fact that the Tocqueville program is made possible uh, and supported by a broad coalition of philanthropic organizations and generous individual donors. Uh, I'll just m name a couple. Um, they include our founding donors, Ginny and Sandy McNeil, who are with us this, this afternoon, um, Beth and Ravenel Curry, the AWC Family Foundation, and the family of Jane Gage Hip. Our sponsors um, support the Tocqueville program because they believe that genuine liberal education encourages students to become more thoughtful students and more dignified human beings. It's a, and we are immensely grateful for their support. So um, let me introduce Dr. Jean Yarborough. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to welcome 
Dr. Yarborough to Furman. We, we have crossed paths professionally several times in different venues over many years. But it's the first time that I've had the opportunity to invite you to, to Furman, and I did it with the help of a student who's here, uh, here somewhere, uh, yeah. uh, who, who happened to visit Bowdoin College where you teach uh, to see another Tocqueville speaker who was going to be there, and they faced off. Gene Yarborough, Professor Gene Yarborough, and Daniel Mahoney faced off, and apparently it was an effective uh, debate. So, and that's the trail that uh, began this process. Um, so, uh, Dr. Yarborough is Professor of Government, and Gary Pendy, Senior Professor of Social Sciences at Bowdoin College. Our teaching responsibilities are in the area of political philosophy and American political thought. She's author of a very fine book entitled American Virtues, Thomas Jefferson and on the Character of a Free People, and has edited uh, The Essential Jefferson, which was published by Hackett Press. Her most recent book is on Theodore Roosevelt is entitled Theodore Roosevelt and the American Political Tradition, and it won the um, Richard Neustadt Award for 2013. This award is given by the uh, American Political Science Association for the person who writes the best book on having something to do with the presidency in any given year. Um, Dr. Yarborough is also author of numerous articles, essays, and book chapters uh, in American political thought and public policy, as well as other topics of political philosophy. She's uh, also uh, twice received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and currently serves on editorial boards with the Review of Politics and Polity. She's even served as a former president of the New England Political Science Association. So if you didn't know it, Bowdoin is in New England. Deep New England. It's in Maine, uh, where it's probably snowing. Um, that, that's what? It's two degrees. That's two degrees. <laughs> two degrees. Yeah, if, if it's not snowing, it's cold. Right. So. Um, before I, I hand over the podium uh, to uh, Dr. Yar Yarbrough, uh, I just want to ask everybody to take a moment to take out your cell phone, or turn it off, or any electronic devices that could be potentially distracting uh, so that we can give our full attention to Dr. Yarbrough. I can say from experience she's a charming, uh, interesting, uh, and lively speaker. And um, I don't think you will be disappointed. So join me in welcoming Professor Jean Yarborough. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, I'm of Hillary Clinton's generation, so I sometimes am not as technologically competent as you young people. Is this working? Yes, yes it is? Good. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, my talk today, uh, if I can try and get myself organized here, it's, um, let's see if I can do that. Uh, my talk today is Tocqueville and the Needs of the Soul. Um, uh, which is a topic that, surprisingly, n I think not that much has been written on. Lots of people who have um, uh, worked on Tocqueville have worked on Tocqueville on uh, the uh, religion and uh, um, politics. Um, they've looked at other, uh, other related aspects of uh, Tocqueville's political thought. But what I really was interested in is just the I, Tocqueville's criticism of so much of 
philosophy and in some way even religion um, uh, uh, because he believed that human beings had a soul and that so much of um, uh, philosophy and uh, American life in particular as he looked around and this imagine is 1830 and he comes here and what he is really struck by is just how materialistic we are. Have we gotten less materialistic over the last almost 200 years? I don't think so. So there is Tocqueville who sees this all and wonders and worries about what the effect of modern life, modern philosophy is on the soul, on human nature, uh, might be another way of beginning uh, to think about it. Um, and what he writes in a letter, right, uh, um, after he published the first volume of <laughs> Democracy in America, is that he saw himself, now d don't use this in contemporary language, uh, he saw himself not as one of the dirty Democrats of his day, but as a liberal of a new kind. Uh, so liberal in the more uh, in the broader, more comprehensive sense, uh, uh, and not in the partisan sense in which we're talking about it today. Uh, uh, Tocqueville was a Frenchman. He's writing in the wake of the French Revolution, and uh, their, their understandings are different. And he sees himself as a different kind of liberal. One of the things that had happened in France was that after the Fran because the Roman Catholic Church had been um, so closely associated with the old regime that when the French Revolution came, the French people then and still, I know there was someone who just studied in France, um, uh, the French uh, uh, have are really uh, in many ways quite anti-clerical, anti-church, they connect um, the corruption of politics and the corruption of the church, and so they're much more hostile to um, uh, religion. And Tocqueville comes to the United States, and he, he's, he's really blown away by the fact that religion and politics, church and state, do not seem to be in such a um, uh, parlous condition as they are in Europe. So he says, I, I, I see myself as a liberal of a different kind. Um, and then many years later, he writes that his sole political passion for 30 years had been to try to bring about the harmony of the liberal sentiment and the religious sentiment because these two things working simultaneously to animate and to restrain uh, souls uh, uh, provide the only basis for true human greatness. So just take that in for a minute. Somehow he wants to take into account a harmonious relationship between religion and politics because this somehow will give voice, sound the depths of the human soul and make it possible for human beings to aim at a kind of greatness. And what makes this also interesting is that Tocqueville himself came from an old aristocratic family. Uh, he w had aristocratic tastes, um, but he was very committed to uh, recognizing that religion, uh, that, that democracy was coming, that you couldn't try and turn it back. What you needed to do was somehow to make it the best that it could be. And so all of these reflections are bound up with his idea of saying, how can human beings be great in a democratic age? We know what they can do at Versailles uh, under Louis XIV, <coughs> but what would greatness look like in a democratic era, and it will be different. And somehow, what the liberal sentiment and the religious sentiment working together will perhaps conduce to um, uh, the continuation of human freedom and also uh, to greatness. And so I saw that my, when I um, 
have been thinking about these things, what I concluded was that there were really three major elements to Tocqueville's thinking on this particular subject, which is the needs of the soul. And the first was that he was very critical of modern philosophy. And I know I spoke to a couple of students today who are philosophy majors. Um, so here you are. This is your moment uh, in the sun to shine. Uh, he was critical of modern philosophy, including the great social contract theorists, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Rousseau was French. And Rousseau was one of the philosophers that Tocqueville said he read every day, spent some time with Rousseau, also with Pascal, and also with Montesquieu, the three of them. These were the people he hung out with, as it were. But he was critical of uh, modern philosophy, including the social contract theorists, because they focused exclusively on the needs of the body to the neglect of the needs of the soul. Uh, the second uh, element of his new liberalism is that he recognized a positive role for revealed religion and in particular Christianity, uh, a positive role in satisfying the needs of the soul. At the same time, he, his, his praise of religion was also tempered by his extremely shrewd <coughs> insight into the way in which democracy transforms religion. And if you think about that, with all of the great questions that are before us today in the various religious denominations, starting with <coughs> divorce, starting a divorce, abortion, gay marriage, uh, the ordination of women as priests, the elevation of women as bishops, all of these kinds of questions, they are in part a function of our living in a democracy. Democracy affects religion. It's not just that religion is out there, you know, <coughs> providing some kind of boundary around politics, but it's, it's, there's a kind of osmosis that goes on. And that was one of Tocqueville's really um, uh, most profound insights that there is this osmosis that, yes, religion seeps into the political order, but the political order also seeps into religion. And then the third um, element of his thinking a new kind of liberalism is that he gives consideration to the needs or longings of the soul in this world. So, you know, the old hymn, in this world and the next. Well, <laughs> Tocqueville has both bases covered. He is concerned <coughs> with um, the needs of the soul here and as well as the needs of the soul in immortality. Um, uh, so one of the things that's really striking about Tocqueville in democracy in America, and by the way, just as a show of hands, how many of you have, uh, have, are familiar with this book? So that I have some idea. Okay, well that's, uh, so I'll try to, uh, I, I will not take for granted that everybody knows all of the fine points of Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville starts his two-volume work not by looking at what we would call the founding. Uh, he doesn't start with the Declaration of Independence. He spends a lot of time talking about the Constitution. He's trying to make this clear to his French readers when he, uh, because the, he, they are the primary audience for his book. But he goes back to the Puritans um, and uh, I could almost say with a slight pun uh, that it was a revelation <coughs> to him to look at the, the origins of American life in the Puritans. And Tocqueville does two things. One, he goes back to the Puritans, and two, he compares the Puritans with the Virginians. Now, I know I may be treading on uh, um, uh, somewhat... Uh, uh, unsteady ground here, but the, uh, what he says is that the Puritans came over here because they wanted to see an idea triumph, and that was the idea of religious freedom, uh, and in order to do that, they established the most radical democracy. He says there was nothing like this even in Athens. 
uh, uh, their democracy. So they, they established a complex idea, and that was what he thought was so really spectacular about them. Uh, that they uh, did not come over here just to make a fast buck. They were not part of a trading company. They came with their wives and their children uh, to establish a new way of life. And he says at one point, it's hard to believe that over 200 years after the Puritans arrived in America, that people still venerate this miserable, this piece of rock. And if you've ever been to Plymouth Rock, you know it is the least, it is, it is very, it's not much of a, of a monument. It's, it's a real downer the first time you see it. Uh, and he says this stone that these poor, bedraggled people touched for a minute has become an object of veneration. And he says, doesn't this show you that all of the greatness of human beings is in their soul? Because it sure isn't in the rock. The rock is bodily. It's physical. Um, it, you can weigh it. You can measure it. It's inert. That's not the great. The greatness of the Puritans is not in Plymouth Rock, but in the idea of Plymouth Rock. And he says, doesn't this show you the, it, the, it, the extraordinariness of the soul? And so he starts um, and goes back to the Puritans. And this allows him to pass over the Declaration of Independence. I, and it is really interesting that Tocqueville went to a Fourth of July ceremony in the United States. He heard the Declaration of Independence read aloud. And he says nothing about it in democracy in America. His beginning, he says, it's the point of my departure. The point of my departure is the Puritans. He then talks about the Constitution, and obviously the Constitution revises in serious ways the Puritan experiment. For one thing, it separates church and state, which the Puritans didn't do. And Tocqueville is also critical of the Puritans. He says their laws were drawn from the Old Testament. Some of them are bizarre. They're tyrannical. Luckily, they don't enforce them very much. Um, uh, and so there are ways in which clearly um, he's not, he's certainly not suggesting that we go back and become modern day Puritans, but he starts there because he sees that the one thing that the Puritans had over the document we all revere is the Puritans did not appe appeal to the laws of nature and nature's God. That doesn't sound like a, a a God who is working actively in the lives of human beings, whereas uh, if you compare that with the Mayflower Compact, the Mayflower Compact um, uh, starts out by saying that they have undertaken to come to the, this new world to govern themselves for the sake of the honor of their country, the glory of God, and the worship of the Christian religion. It's all right there. That's a pretty um, full-throated uh, statement of what the principles are. And it's interesting, one, would ha one has to ask, why did he start with that statement of principles uh, rather than the Declaration of Independence? And he goes on uh, at some length and discusses the Puritans. He's, as I say, he thinks there are, they're a little extreme, but the thing that really um, uh, stands out with him is that they provide a model for how people can be free, they can govern themselves and not commit the kind of atrocities that the French committed during the Reign of Terror. And he calls it an impious maxim that people conclude that they can do anything. And so there's a kind of nihilism that comes, sets in when one throws off the salutary yoke of religious prohibition, that thou shalt not kill comes in handy uh, when you're thinking about killing all of the French aristocrats. And so what you have, and he, he's really impressed with this, and he starts with it. 
So just a few points about the social contract theorists. I'm not going to say anything about our beloved document, the Declaration of Independence. But if you look at Thomas Hobbes, who wrote the Leviathan, the Leviathan actually um, uh, uh, dismisses the idea that there are any immaterial substances, which Hobbes says very early on in the Leviathan is absurd. All there is is matter and motion. Um, this is real. You know, you can put me on a scale, you can weigh me, you can measure me, you can, you know, play around with my hair, like Donald Trump allowed that guy to do. These are physical things. This is the real world. You can weigh it, you can measure it. Uh, this is what we are, and that's what Hobbes is getting at. Locke is also um, similarly a materialist, um, but his project is simply not, he, he's not so much in your face about it, but what he would like to do is to shift um, uh, uh, emphasis from the needs of the soul stop people from fighting over religious principles. What's, what's the status of free grace? What's the status of uh, predestination? What, uh, uh, grace or free will or uh, predestination? Let's not have people fighting about things like this. Let's just put them to work and let them get rich and protect their rights to private property. And what Tocqueville sees is, wow, that worked out all too well. That seems to be all that they ever think about. That seems to be the problem. And what Tocqueville thinks is that if this is what people think about all the time, it leads to a certain flattening of the soul. It leads to a lowering of ambition. That you do not dream big dreams if what you are thinking about solely is making money. This does not talk to the higher aspirations of human beings. He's not opposed to money. You can read in his private letters that he's, um, he's investing in uh, American railroads and losing money. Um, uh, so it's not that he's hostile to wealth, but if this is the sole purpose of your life, then there's something missing there, and that is his point. But mostly, he thinks about Rousseau. Rousseau, in uh, the second discourse, which some of you may have read, um, actually says, speaks, pays lip service to the soul. He says that we have a soul. Uh, well, that's good. But this soul clearly is not in any way connected with um, uh, immortality. Um, and Rousseau's soul is something more or less that human beings are working on themselves. It's a human project, not anything more than that. It's not intrinsic to our nature. Uh, it is certainly not God-given. It's just our internal project. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think that Tocqueville finds that to be um, uh, adequate either. Uh, and finally, with respect to the, so the three social contract theorists, he thinks that they have too reductive a view of human passions. Hobbes famously said, fear of violent death. That's it. That's all we're dealing with here. We've got to get everybody in the world afraid of violent death, because if they're afraid of violent death, they will not make war. They'll be peaceful. So we want that. Um, uh, Locke, of course, wants, uh, uh, wants to empower or unleash acquisitiveness. Um, uh, and Tocqueville thinks that these, uh, these accounts of human beings, what is, what is Rousseau? Rousseau says, says, let's go back to prehistoric man, animal man, he calls him, before <laughs> human beings have the capacity for speech before they have the capacity for reason, before they have the capacity for imagination. They are asocial, each one. Oh. <laughs> that used to be in the cover. Um, <laughs> all right. I'll, uh, they are asocial. Uh, I'll, I'll fix this. I'm
Uh, I get so excited when I talk about Rousseau's <laughs> animal man, uh, you know, who is, who is just one of these cavemen. And uh, he, his relations with women, I mean, he, Rousseau describes this as the first hookups of the, of the human race. This is all it is for eons and how, who knows how long. So uh, if he talks about uh, uh, human beings there, what, whatever he discovers in their makeup, how does that, what, what guidance does that give us for how we should be living in our far more complex society? Um, and so uh, Tocqueville thinks that these accounts of human psychology are too reductive, they're too narrow. They can't account for Tocqueville's passions. Tocqueville's greatest passion is his taste for political liberty. He says, I have God-given um, uh, desires to be great. Who's talking about that? Certainly not Hobbes, um, not Locke, not Rousseau. Uh, it doesn't account for the pride in self-government, not the kind of vanity and vainglory that Hobbes condemned, but a, a, a decent pride in your capacity to handle your own affairs, to take responsibility for yourself. So it leaves out pride. And most of all, it leaves out the uh, two of the central passions, hope and terror. <coughs> hope. Um, what can we hope for? What can we hope for in this world? What can we hope for in the next world? And terror. Terror is not just fear of violent death, that if you, you know, go into a war zone, you may get killed. If you go into s the wrong neighborhoods at the, at the wrong time of the day, uh, or I'm thinking of Chicago, maybe any time of the day, um, uh, uh, that's a fear of violent death, but terror, um, Tocqueville says, uh, what I am concerned with is terror at the idea that there is nothingness, or worse, eternal damnation. Is that a possibility? Um, so these political philosophies, these political psychologies are just much too narrow. They don't they don't express the full um, uh, breadth of human longings and human demand, uh, the hum human uh, personality. The problem with the social contract theory, I think um, uh, Rousseau puts it very nicely when he says, a fall, and I love this, I use this quotation all the time with my students. It's very handy, so, uh, so take note of it and think about it. A false idea, but one clear and precise, will always have more power in the world than a true but complex idea. He says it in conjunction with American federalism. Uh, you know, it's a complicated idea, but you can apply it to, well, you, I'll leave that to you, but you can apply it to a lot of different things. A simple but false idea has more power. So, you know, John Stuart Mill, call your office. Um, this, you know, this art where you're just going to have this great combat where uh, the truths are going to fight it, fight it out in the uh, public sphere. Uh, it may not happen. What if a simple idea that's wrong has more power than a correct idea that's so complicated that you, it's difficult to explain? Um, I have a personal story about that, but it, it's not that interesting. Um, uh, all right. <laughs> no, but you'll, you'll see that I was right. It is not that interesting. But I was once, when I was a very young assistant professor, asked uh, uh, to go head to head with Birch Bayh, who was not, uh, not Evan Bayh, his father, um, who was senator from Indiana. And uh, Birch Bayh had, had a, a, a really ha was very opposed to the Electoral College. And so he, we were each asked to write in, I think, Parade Magazine, a um, hundred words in defense and in opposition to the Electoral College. He had no trouble. You know, it's undemocratic. Uh, uh, 
end of story. I really had to struggle to try to explain why this institution was good in a hundred words, but I'm happy to say that my father's entire life, he had it laminated and he carried it around with him in his wallet. Um, so that was nice. Anyway, so uh, one of the things that is, uh, it, it, we have a, a, a simple idea that just is more powerful than a complex idea. Um, so. <coughs> Tocqueville wants to offer us a more complicated uh, idea. In uh, Democracy in America, in volume, uh, in volume two, um, he talks about philosophy. He's looking at uh, the effect of democracy on the mind. He's talking about various philosophies. And he, he, he talks about how when the religious impulse is thwarted. People channel these religious desires into bizarre follies. And, and he tries to explain why that's the case. And he says, man did not give himself the taste for the infinite and the love for what is immortal. These sublime instincts are not born of a caprice of his will. They have their immovable foundation in his nature. They exist despite his efforts. He can hinder or deform them, but he cannot destroy them. The soul has needs that must be satisfied. So that's where I got my title from. Um, we have these needs. And here's the other interesting thing, the way in which he departs from Rousseau. We're not giving ourselves the soul. We're not, the soul is, is something that is given to us. Um, not that it's not something that we're just in the business of making. And I think this is one of the reasons why he's so critical of these other uh, philosophies. He says that we have a taste for the infinite. We have a love of the immortal. And so he looks around and says, well, what philosophers are teaching us about a taste for the infinite and a love of the immortal? And he's already now implied that the social contract theorists are not enough. The only philosopher that he discusses at any length in democracy in America is Descartes. Um, and what he says about uh, Cartesian philosophy, Descartes is famous for having <coughs> doubted everything, um, uh, is that the Americans have followed Descartes. They, we have all adopted Descartes' methods. You know, we're all from Missouri. We all say, show me. We doubt everything that we can't see for ourselves. He says, we've adopted Descartes' method without ever reading Descartes because we're too busy making money to sit down and read uh, Descartes' method. Uh, it's, it's too long, it's too withdrawn, we're, we're, uh, too drawn out. We're not going to do that. Um, so this is the result. Um, we're Cartesians without ever having read Descartes. Uh, the problem is, is that this, um, this leads to doubt in everything. Uh, once we begin, we don't just doubt, you know, is this real? Where am I? Who am I? But we begin to doubt everything. And he shows you how this doubt spreads out from one century to another. And it just metastasizes. And it takes over every everything. We doubt everything. And the problem, Tocqueville says, is that when you get stuck in this in this condition of doubting everything. It makes, it really paralyzes you. You can't act. Um, you don't, should I, uh, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? You think of um, T.S. Eliot, do I dare to eat a peach? Um, uh, every, every decision is so momentous. We are just stuck in this condition of doubt. It's paralyzing. And what it does then is lead us to say, let's not think at all. <laughs> let's, just for, let's just party um, uh, uh, for the rest of your life. We're not going to think about these things. So the condition of being in a permanent state of doubt 
is that it's very debilitating to the soul. You can't do anything that requires risk or sacrifice if you doubt, well, is this a good idea or a bad idea? And doubt becomes the universal condition. Uh, and um, uh, 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 Tocqueville thinks that this, we, we wander into a kind of abyss. And all of what this does is flatten the soul and enervate the soul. And he says, what, what we have to do is to try to think of everything we can that will elevate the soul, that will lift us up, that will expand us rather than contract us. And he says, even if all you are dedicated to is material wealth. Even then, you use your soul in thinking about how you're going to get it. You're not like some animal. You're not like a squirrel just, you know, piling up acorns. Um, you have a mind. You have a soul. You have longings. And, and if this is, if you begin to lose these things, you, uh, you're just going to become Nietzsche's last man, um, you'll be herd-like, contemptible, uh, people who just live for their momentary pleasures. And these are the things that Tocqueville, a hundred and uh, almost 200 years ago, warns this country of, and, and modern democracy more generally. Uh, he invokes uh, Pascal and says uh, of uh, pa Blaise Pascal, the great Catholic thinker, that human beings have both an angel and a brute, and no philosophy that puts all the emphasis on one is correct. It may produce some phenomenal examples of people who were so ascetic that they made great sacrifices, um, or you know these fantastic tyrants who indulged their bo every bodily desire. But it does not really speak to the longings of human beings. And um, uh, 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 much of this comes out in democracy in America. And there's a long passage where he says, you know, he takes up the question, well, all right, the moderns, they, they're, you know, they're not useless, but they're incorrect on this because they have, they, have they have marginalized, bracketed out the soul. What about the ancients? He says, well, they're ancient materialists, um, but they, never, they don't endure because they just, again, they don't have the power that will keep people, uh, make people want to preserve and read them. But he does say, um, a, a hold out a great hope uh, or praise for Socrates. And he says, this was precisely Socrates' great achievement. It is not certain, he says, that Socrates and his school had decided opinions about what would happen to man in the other life. But the sole belief that they were, that they were uh, which, on which they settled, that the soul has nothing in common with the body and that it survives it, was enough to give Platonic philosophy the sort of sublime spark that distinguishes it. And earlier in this uh, chapter, he explains why. He says, belief in an immortal and Im immaterial principle, united for a time with matter, is so necessary to the greatness of man that it produces beautiful effects, even when one does not join to it an opinion in favor of rewards and punishments. And when one is limited to believing that after death the divine principle contained in man either is absorbed back into God or goes into another animate creature. Isn't there a movie now out about dogs and the reincarnation of their soul? You know, th this is all, it's right on point. And he says that he thinks that human beings would be less brutalized by believing that after their deaths, their souls migrated into the bodies of pigs than that they didn't have a soul at all. Um, so these are, these are some of uh, Tocqueville's um, uh, meditations on uh, religion. And then uh, he goes on in volume one of Democracy in America and he talks about 
um, uh, that the fact that religion is useful for people, but in addition to being useful for people, he says religion is also natural. Just pause because that's kind of a that's a that's a really a a, a big thought to um, to uh, consider, and he and he goes on to explain it in the following way. He says, uh, the short space of 60 years that human beings are alive is not sufficient to satisfy all of their longings. In this world, their joys remain incomplete. They may be very good, but they remain incomplete. As a result, men scorn life, and they have an immense desire to live. Disgust and fear of nothingness torment them. These contradictory instincts lead them to contemplate another world where their souls will at last be satisfied. Religion, therefore, is only a particular form of hope, and it is as natural to the human heart as hope itself. Notice that Tocqueville does not say that, re uh, that religion is the only form of hope. Uh, and I will return to that in just a few moments. But it is certainly a very powerful form of hope. Uh, to put it another way, religion is powerful because, as he says, it depends on one of the constituent principles <coughs> of human nature. Human beings are uh, want not to die. They want not to perish. I, this, I know these are hard and perhaps um, uh, not altogether, uh, they're not beliefs that are easy for young people who are all the immortals to think about. Um, what Tocqueville is saying is everyone has a desire for immortality, but you young people inevitably think they are immortal, so that desire isn't as strong in you. But as you get more miles on the odometer, you begin to think about, is this all there is? You know, um, what, what about those people who have been bad? Will they, will they get their just desserts? What about the people who are good? Why do bad things happen to good people? Is there some reason to hope that these things in the end will all work out right? And so these are the kinds of reflections, he says, that lead people to ask and think about um, uh, religion, because religion is another form of hope. And then Tocqueville goes on in a, a, a marginal note, uh, a note, not a marginal, but a note that he wrote in the margin, uh, and, and writes uh, in his own name, this, Tocqueville's own thoughts, and how different they are from Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and the rest of the gang. Um, I firmly believe in another, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, the need for the infinite and sad experience of the finite. This is us. We have a need for the infinite and a sad experience of the finite that we encounter at every step torments me but does not distress me for I see it as one of the greatest proofs of the existence of another world and of the immortality of our souls. From what we know of God by his works, he adds, we know that he does everything with a purpose. Arguing by analogy from the physical world, Tocqueville then asserts, I cannot believe that God has given us an organ of the infinite and not any way to satisfy that. Um, and so those are Tocqueville's own views on this question of the soul. We have a soul. We have an immortal soul. Uh, and it's something that we need to think about. Does our political, do our political organizations, does our political philosophy give adequate recognition to that soul? Um, and so this is what uh, um, uh, is some of the more, to me, some of the more interesting passages in Tocqueville. And he says that the first object of religion is to supply clear and precise answers uh, to questions about God. 
the nature of the soul, and our moral duties to others. These are the things that we, uh, that this is what religion does. And when religion is destroyed, doubt takes hold of the highest portions of the intellect and paralyzes all the others. <coughs> Such a state, as I mentioned earlier, cannot fail to enervate souls. It slackens the springs of the will and prepares citizens for servitude. And so Tocqueville is led to this conclusion. If a man has faith, he must serve. Uh, if he has no faith, he must serve. And if he is free, he must believe. Um, now, he looks at, he comes to America and he looks at Protestantism, he looks at Catholicism, and he says, Here's the story. Here's the scoop. The Protestants have become very tolerant. They go to each other's um, religious services, um, uh, but they're, they're basically losing all their steam. They, they've run out of gas. They're virtually inert. Their toleration has led to indifference. And what I see happening is that many of these Protestants are going to slip into a kind of deism, or they're just going to stop going to church altogether. The other alternative is that you have Catholics. And he says of the Catholics, I hope I won't be giving offense to anyone. Uh, Tocqueville himself was raised a Catholic. Um, uh, that the Catholics are. Um, intolerant. He says, but they're intolerant in the way that only people who believe are intolerant. If you believe something, you can't be completely tolerant. Um, you, if you think that, that the fate of your soul depends upon your doing certain things, you can't say, well, I'll split the difference with you. Um, and so that makes them intolerant. But he looks at what is going on in Catholi in, with Catholicism in America, and he says that on all of the secondary matters, Catholicism has become more Protestant. There's no more um, uh, special worship of the saints. There are no more relics. Um, uh, the whole uh, form of, of worship is becoming simpler. And if, th if those of you who are of, of any religious faith, if you have been into a Catholic church uh, in the last, uh, in your lifetime, um, it's really astonishing how similar they are to Protestant churches. Uh, and that was, that was Tocqueville's point. They're very similar to Protestant churches in terms of all what he calls the secondary um, uh, matters. But in the primary matters, they still believe in certain um, non-negotiable features. And these really are the dogmatic questions of religion. And this is what souls need. And he says uh, in a wonderful letter, um, and uh, Professor Tessitore has written about this correspondence, but in a wonderful letter to Artur de Gobineau, that um, uh, religion always has an element of intolerance in it, because it is based on faith and on revelation. And you can't prove it, and you know, and and everybody come to the same opinion. And it there is a certain amount of intolerance, but a little bit of intolerance is a good thing. It's a kind of grit. It's that sandpaper that keeps the soul, you know, in good trim and fighting order. And so he's not altogether. Um, uh, he sees some hope for. Uh, um, the continuation of religion in America. The problem that he sees with many of the Protestant sects is that the preachers now regard religion as a good thing for the sake of good morals and good order, and this, if you follow it through to the end, will make you rich. And Tocqueville says, no, 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 you got that all wrong. This is, uh, religion is supposed to, 
cut into the desire for bodily satisfactions and bodily gratifications. It's not the means to more of them. And so he said, and, and in this way he points out the, uh, what I, what I um, <clears throat> indicated at the very beginning of my talk, that there is a kind of osmosis between democracy and revealed religion. We think revealed religion is providing a boundary, a moral boundary, within, within which we can act, and that is partly true. But it is also the case that religion is permeating, uh, that democracy is permeating religion. And it's making us think that, re well, religion is good for the kids. They won't get into trouble, they won't do drugs, and then they'll get into a good school and they'll have a successful life. Uh, but that's, uh, Tocqueville says, um, this has become a kind of religion, but it's not really, this is not really what religion is about. And so he leaves you with a very, what's interesting about his discussion of religion as a um, a, a way of reviving the soul and thinking about questions of the soul is that this is a far more complicated relationship because it's a two-way street and we have to also be attentive to the way in which religion is co-opted or captured by these very powerful materialistic interests, the desire for material gratification that is one of the major themes that runs throughout democracy in America. Um, so Tocqueville gives a defense of religion um, both for its utility, it does do good things, but he also defends religion because it is linked up with the soul. In the same way, he does the same thing with liberty. Liberty is good and liberty is useful, but at the very end of the old regime and the revolution in France, Tocqueville talks about the passion for liberty and the, re uh, and the religious passions. And he says, I can more easily see a person who has religious passions uh, also animated by a passion for liberty than I can see a person who has religious passions animated by a desire for material goods. Um, uh, he said, these two things just don't seem to me to coexist in the same soul that easily. Uh, and, uh, and what they have in common, both the desire for <clears throat> liberty and the religious passion, is that they speak to the immaterial they speak to the immortal in some sense. If you, make a, if you are Thomas Jefferson, you live on because of the great political deeds that you've done. There's a kind of immortality that um, uh, can issue from political acts as well as from uh, religious acts. And so he says both politics and religion aim at immortality, and they balance, they counteract what is inevitable the de, the, uh, in a democracy, that we want to live well, we want to live comfortably. And Tocqueville makes it clear he is not opposed to people living well and living comfortably. He says we've got to get some kind of balance in ourselves. It, I know I sound like a, a, you know, I, I, I shrink, uh, we ha but we do. A, this is Tocqueville's political psychology. We have to get a balance in our, in ourselves, in our souls. Um, you can't. You should not just allow yourself to be dominated by the desire for material well-being. And both liberty and um, religion speak to these immaterial longings that human beings have. And I want just to end with um, a comment that he makes about liberty in uh, the old regime. He wonders in uh, the old regime, his other great book about the French Revolution, where does this mysterious passion come from that has inspired men at all times to the greatest actions? Political liberty is much more than the desire for independence. It's not independence. 
which arises only in response to a particular grievance. We have a Declaration of Independence. We want to throw out the Brits. But liberty is more. That It's not just overthrowing a regime. Um, it, uh, uh, because independence vanishes when that evil is removed. Nor is the true love of liberty, he writes, born of the desire for material goods. In the long run, liberty usually does produce material prosperity, but it may also require its sacrifice, perhaps even the ultimate sacrifice. Rather, Tocqueville writes, freedom has its own attractions and charms, apart from whatever incidental rewards it brings. It is the pleasure of being able to act, speak, and breathe without constraint and under the government of God and the laws alone. Whoever seeks for anything from freedom but itself is made for slavery. Why, he wonders, do certain nations pursue freedom through all kinds of perils and miseries? For them, freedom is a good so precious and so necessary that no other could console them for its loss. Others tire of liberty in the midst of their prosperity, and they let it be taken from their hands without resistance. What accounts for their lack of desire to be free? For Tocqueville, this sublime desire is a mystery, akin, perhaps, to the mystery of grace. Listen to the way he describes it. It enters into the great hearts that God has prepared uh, to receive it. It fills them, it fires them. One must give up on making this comprehensible to the mediocre souls who never felt it. Doesn't that make your heart just swell? Yes, it's the soul speaking. Um, although it may be impossible to explain why some men and some nations love liberty for its own sake and will make any sacrifice to hold on to it, the fact that they do testifies to the power of Tocqueville's distinctive liberalism. He is indeed a liberal of a new kind. His is a new liberalism, one that gives voice to the imperishable and immaterial longings of the soul in this world, for, uh, the immaterial longings of the soul in this world, and for immortality in the next. It is a humane and generous liberalism that sets the human spirit free within that fatal circle to uh, strive for a distinctively democratic form of greatness, and one Tocqueville dares to hope that is more pleasing to God. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, should I, can I go? You're going to have some, no, you can't go. Oh. In fact, you need, why don't you stand over here? Just have a microphone issue, which is why I'm up here. So uh, Dr. Yarbo has agreed to take some questions uh, from the audience. Our hearts are swollen, I think. Our minds are stimulated. So we start generally with a question from a student. student. Yes. So let's yes. start there. And I'm here because of this microphone. Um, someone needs working? to re-articulate the question into oh. the microphone. Oh, I see. We don't have a microphone. Would you like me to do that? Or? Sure. OK. All right. So um, Mr. Cooper. Um, you spoke about, uh, or you, you gave us this quote about false ideas that are clear and concise that you know, we're generally going to accept that before a more complex but true one. But it seems to uh, speak of human credulity. <coughs> um, and later on, uh, you, talk, you talked about uh, Tocqueville's mentioning that, that Americans are Cartesians who have never read Descartes. And that seems to speak to our doubtfulness. Um, does Tocqueville believe that credulity and doubt sort of uh, temper each other into moderation in the same sense that sort of politics and religion do? Or is this specific to America? Or I don't know that I would. I, 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 that's a long question, too. To <laughs> this is challenging. That's a lot. Uh, so in, in uh, credulity and um, 
and doubt, and is there some way that they can be made to balance each other off right. for the sake of moderation? Right. It seems like you don't want to always doubt everything, but you don't want to believe everything as well. You've got to have it's somewhere in the middle, right? Oh, well, I, actually, Tocqueville, uh, if you look at the quote, he, start, he says, I, a great man once said, and he quotes Pascal, and then he says, but this is what I think. I think you start from belief, and then after a while, your beliefs are challenged, and you fall into a state of doubt. And most of us stay in that state of doubt, and only very few of us work our way out of that state of doubt. And it's never, and, and he says further, it's not clear that we ever arrive at the degree of certainty that we had before we doubted those beliefs. So I, I, I would say that, but as, as for the, uh, I think the other idea is related to that, but I would not so much use them against each other. I think he's just, in a way, saying in, in democracies, people look for simple explanations. They haven't got time, they're not gonna sit down, and they don't have six different um, uh, arguments at their fingertips to give back to you. And as a result, somebody makes a, uh, uh, a statement and it's clear and precise, and that is what um, people uh, uh, can identify with and approve of. And so that's, you know, that's just something that I, I think is really, it's just, I think it's a good way of um, uh, having a little, I, I think that it is, a, uh, it does instill moderation. Um, you don't have this idea of John Stuart Mill that everybody should get out there and just battle it out in the, you know, in the marketplace of ideas because sometimes terrible ideas can win out. I'm not a student, but I do have a question that might be different. Uh, in, in terms of the age of enlightenment, we're all students. <laughs> glad to be. Uh, in terms of the age of enlightenment, there was a question of tolerance versus intolerance. There was a concept that was developed, or developed, it's been developed before that, but was exposed, uh, spoken on, was the, the end justifies the means. And I'm curious to know what you would say, how would uh, Tocqueville come down on this, this question? Well, I think that this is part, a part of what um, uh, Tocqueville is, uh, Tocqueville sees the Age of Enlightenment as um, a way of uh, really tamping down religious passions and intolerance. Uh, but the, the method that they took was basically to just try to shift everybody away from thinking about religious questions altogether. You know, it's like, look over there. Look at that shiny object over there. Um, material gratification. Why bother with this over here? You know, I mean, all these questions about dogma. Look, just, you know, there's a whole world out there to be exploited. And that had a real appeal. And what Tocqueville is saying is, I don't want to bring back massive intol intolerance. I'm not for auto de fe's. I don't want the counter reformation. I don't want, you know, uh, um, uh, the reformation. I don't want the religious wars. But on the other hand, we have we have gone very far overboard because much of the Enlightenment was atheistic. It basically said, you know, that you don't you don't need God. Everything is here on this earth, and the and the way in which we can have peace is by not introducing these questions where people divide and divide so bitterly. So if you can find a way in which you have people who can. Um, argue with each other, but not want to kill each other, even though the arguments are very deep, um, uh, that's preferable to the, the, he thought the Enlightenment was far, and the Enlightenment might be a very good example of a simple idea um, that has more power than a complex one uh, it, that is true. Um, so correct me if this is maybe too reductive, Sure. Tocqueville, but it, there seems to be sort of this synthetic relationship between liberal and democratic tendencies and religion. And does the sort of relationship that he wants them to form in you know, making this whole debate, is it just merely an equilibrium? And I guess my other question would be, is there 
are one of these components, is it naturally or can it naturally overpower the other? And I should say, these liberal tendencies naturally overpower our religious tendencies, and should we sort of consciously keep them in check? Well, in, in his private letters where he talks about Pascal and the angel and the brute, um, he says uh, in the aristocratic ages, <coughs> There was so much asceticism. There was so much spirituality. You have people, you know, flagellating themselves, starving themselves, hallucinating, giving up every conceivable bodily comfort, pleasure, all for the sake of a very high spirituality. And he says, I, I, I'm not looking to bring back St. Jerome. Uh, but I don't want to bring back Heliogobulus either. I, what we need, to go back to your point, is some kind of moderation. And he says we need a middle path. And the middle path in a democracy will probably uh, come down uh, more on the side of material gratification than the needs of the soul. But the problem that he sees is that the needs of the soul have been fundamentally eclipsed. So you need to have some kind of, one could say, mixed regime. Um, but the, and the democratic element will clearly be in the ascendant. It's a democratic age. And the, the democratic passion, he never tires of telling us, is the desire for material comfort, material gratification. But if that's, and what he's saying is, if that's all you are, is somebody who lives to turn on the home shopping network, um, you know, you're obviously missing out on something. Mm -hmm. This student in the back. In terms of religion, yes. um, I don't. I, Tocqueville writes with um, a great sensitivity about the plight of the American Indians, but he 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 was not an anthropologist, and he didn't go around uh, investigating people's um, uh, 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 particular specific religious beliefs and uh, or examining any of those uh, I suspect that he would think that they were too close to pantheism uh, but uh, that's that's just a guess because I'm not an expert on Native American religions either uh, but um, the sense that w that somehow uh, uh, nature is really the God, the great spirit. These are all things I, that I didn't get into uh, in my talk today. Uh, because one, uh, here's, a, here's I'll leave you with another thought too, which is if Tocqueville is right that we really do have these religious longings, we have these desires for the immaterial, and uh, the, then the possibility is that okay, maybe um, uh, established religion in the form in which we know it uh, holds fewer charms. So what happens? A lot of my students, and I'm sure, and I, as I saw the campus, I can see how it might also be the case here. Uh, uh, people are drawn to other religions. Uh, and not only other religions, but they're drawn to pantheism. And Tocqueville, in it's a brief chapter, but a very powerful chapter, in which he says what pantheism is is take it is taking equality to the final stage because it denies the distinction between the creator and his creatures. Um, we are all God, we are all part of God, we all go back to God. Uh, you know, you, I won't step on, I won't kill a mosquito. I'm not a pantheist and I would kill a mosquito. Um, <laughs> and mice, too. Uh, um, but uh, the idea that every, every living creature contains this element of the divine and the divine is in everything. There are numerous problems connected with pantheism, but pantheism is on the rise. Uh, Neo-paganism is on the rise. I mean, uh, I don't know how it is in Greenville, South Carolina, but I know people who are shamans and practice all sorts of new age spirituality. 
Um, so it's, uh, or, I, or I could give you Chesterton's account, people who don't believe in God are not people who don't believe in nothing. They'll believe in anything. Um, uh, so you take these, these uh, longings for the, di for the divine and you just, they get displaced. They real, and that's Tocqueville's point. They don't really go away. I mean, you can displace them and you can, you can make a religion out of, uh, out of getting rich. You can make, you, uh, but you go looking. When people go looking for meaning, they go looking for meaning somewhere. Um, and there are, and, and so not every form of spirituality is one that he would approve of, uh, pantheism being, uh, a very good example, and one could say that there are elements of environmentalism that are really pantheistic. So if you consider that, then the religious impulse has just migrated to other places, and you'd have to look for them there. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've run out of time for questions in this forum, but there are refreshments right outside the door and toward the uh, atrium, so please, um, Stay and ask Dr. Yarborough your questions, and let's uh, just give her one more round of applause.